Good evening, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. We are excited that you are joining us for BUILD and this session with the Fluid Framework team. This is uh, your chance to participate with the team live, ask a lot of questions. My name is Jakob Nielsen and I'm a designer on the Fluid Framework team. I work with early adopters of the technology. My job today is to be the moderator for this session. Ask, follow you along in the questions, ask the questions to uh, the developers that we have uh, on the panel. And what I'll do is quickly uh, uh, switch over to Sam Bruner, which you may have uh, seen earlier today in the keynote. He's one of the developers on the team, and he will walk us through what we are going to do in this particular session. So let me get Sam uh, online. All righty. Hi, Sam. <laughs> Thank you, Jaco. All right. So uh, today we're going to have a question and answer session with the Fluid team. I'm here with a group of experts, um, and we're uh, let's get started. So. We'll just go over what we're going to do. That's what we're doing right now, what to expect. We'll go into team introductions. I want you to meet um, all the other engineers on the team. And then we'll go into a brief overview of Fluid. We'll talk about Fluid Preview. That's the productivity application you saw. And then we'll also talk about Fluid Framework. That's the developer toolkit that we're going to open source that Rajesh talked about today. Then we're going to do, more excitingly, a two minute coding walkthrough and then we'll answer all your questions. So that's it. To do this, if you haven't done it before, you can use the chat box. I think it's on your right to ask questions, uh, upvote your favorites. We'll try to answer the most popular ones verbally, and we'll also answer some of them actually in line in the chat. And then uh, this session may be recorded for internal use, um, but we're also probably gonna publish it externally because we think this could be really helpful for a variety of people. And then we trust everyone to have a great discussion and we want this to be a great experience for everyone. So if you could, please just stay mindful of Microsoft's code of conduct. All right, so I am Sam Broner. I am a software engineer on the Fluid Core team and I've been with the team for about three years now. And then this is Skylar. He's another engineer and we've worked together for a while now. Thanks, Sam. Hi, I'm Skylar Jokiel. I'm a software engineer on the Fluid Core team, and I'm going to throw you over to one of my good colleagues, Nat. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Rocco. I'm also an engineer on the Fluid Core team, uh, working with Skylar a lot, uh, working on views in particular lately. Uh, and next, I'll introduce you to uh, Christian. Hi, I'm Christian Gonzalez. I'm an engineer on the Fluid Experiences team. I've been working alongside the Fluid Core team to build new experiences in M365 on top of Fluid Framework. Uh, the most famous one is probably the Fluid Preview we now Spatic at Ignite. I'd like to introduce one of my colleagues, Dan Costanero, who I've worked with on Fluid Preview for quite some time. And hi, I'm Dan Costanero. I'm a program manager on the Fluid Framework. And uh, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Sam and he's gonna lead us through some exciting things. <laughs> All right. Uh, great, I think I will. Uh, let's. Uh, so we just did team introductions. We walked through our agenda, and now uh, let's give a brief overview of Fluid. So when we talk with the Fluid Framework Developer Preview, that is the um, the open source software that we're excited to to bring out to all of you in the coming weeks. So we have a few key concepts that I want to talk about. Then we're going to do a few key terms, and then we'll talk about Fluid Preview. So. Fluid Framework Developer Preview comes with a distributed application model. And this natively enables multi-person collaboration, and it's just really, really fast. You're gonna notice that immediately. We also use the, the web as a platform. So you'll be able to use all of the tech you use already, whether that's a front-end framework or some sort of state management framework. We're leveraging that and trying to build on top of it. And then Fluid is hostable and portable. So our interactive components can be used in a variety of Fluid-enabled web applications. You may have seen uh, in the demos earlier today in Rajesh's keynote that we put a table into Outlook for the web. We put a table into Teams. So you could collaborate live across multiple canvases. And then lastly, we've got composable solutions. So we 
are trying to inspire people to bring these reusable components into custom applications that better fit some sort of workflow or template that you want to do. So that's our concepts, but now let's tie those into specific fluid terms on the next slide. <clears throat> so when we talk about distributed data structures, we're talking about local objects that create an eventually consistent state across all of your connected clients. And we provide a core set of these that we think are quite powerful. The Fluid Preview was built ground up on these distributed data structures. So it's clearly powerful enough to power that kind of comprehensive experience. And then we've got Fluid Components. These are bundles of traditional JavaScript code and our distributed data structures. When I think about this, I think about bundling business logic and state together in something that can be deployed anywhere because we have the fluid loader. So this is a snippet of code that you include on your application if you want to be able to host fluid components and the fluid loader fetches a fluid component and connects it to the necessary endpoints so that it's up to date and connected to the other clients. So it's pulling in that bundle of business logic and distributed data structures and making sure it's, it's uh, live and in sync. And then lastly, we've got our fluid applications. These are groups of components that can be deployed standalone uh, and viewed on their own. All right, uh, and then we've got Fluid Preview. So Fluid Preview uh, was built ground up with Fluid Framework. It works across M365, and uh, we support already integration with Teams and Outlook for web, but there's more to come. And you also might have seen the .fluid file type today. That's going to be the Fluid Home within SharePoint Online. All right, so that was uh, some concepts and an overview, but let's do something a little bit more fun and let's uh, look at some of our code. So we have here the output of our bootstrapper. And when we talk about it, we talk about the dice roller. This is like kind of our little canonical example that we show people when, when they get started. So I'm gonna click roll on the right here. And I know this is a little lame because I'm on my local host, but you can imagine that I'm collaborating with Matt or Christian or Skylar. Uh, right here when, when they have this open on their own on their own machine. So I'm going to roll, things are up to date. We do this using the concepts we talked about before. Let's tie it into the code. So I have here my build component, uh, which extends our primed component. And a primed component is one of those bundles of business logic and distributed state, but it also comes with a few key things that we think make it much easier for you to get started uh, building a component out. The first is this root object here. This is one of our distributed data structures that I also talked about um, that's eventually consistent. This is a shared directory. And what we're doing here is we're setting a value on that shared directory, we're setting it to one. That was the initial state of my dice roller. It was uh, you know one dot on the die. And then we also do this with the root. We also eventually will listen to changes. But I wanna talk about this function that I'm in right now. This is the component initializing first time function. And I like to think about this as a schema. It's uh, a schema setting function. It's called by the very first client to connect. And once this is done, every client that joins afterwards will have dice key values sitting in their root. And the value in the dice key will update using our distributed data structures. So the next thing that happens is every client that joins, once that component, once our build component has initialized, um, we'll call this function. And in here, we'll listen to changes on the root. Uh, and a change to the root could be caused by something like clicking the button that I clicked in the prior example. The last thing I just want to mention is we have this render function. Just like so many other components, we need some way to show the user what we've done. So to go back, we've got our build component. It extends prime component, a bundle of business logic and distributed state. Uh, we've got our root distributed data structure, a shared directory. We've got a schema setting function and then, you know, some rendering and, and uh, event listening functions. All right, that's a brief overview. We'll dive more into it with your questions. Uh, but now, oh, one thing I almost forgot, it will be open sourced. You can use that QR code to find out more. We're so excited about this. So uh, feel free to ask us anything. We'll take a look at some of the first questions now and I'll turn it back over to Jakob to moderate that. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Sam. So uh, as uh, Sam was talking, we have been doing a poll in, um, in the meeting Q&A to see uh, what the next topic should be that we should talk about. And uh, I'd like to uh, leave it over to uh, Christian to talk about the fluidpreview.com experience. So uh, Christian, are you ready to present? 
Yeah, thanks, Jakob. So as we announced at Ignite, one of the big one of the big announcements at Ignite last year was this Fluid Preview experience. And the way you get to it is you go to fluidpreview.com. And what that was was kind of the way we showed the world Fluid Preview for the first time. And what I'm going to talk to you today is not so much what Fluid Preview can do, but rather how it relates to the Fluid framework that we're open sourcing. So Fluid Preview was designed as kind of, you know, this application that was meant to push the Fluid Framework. It was, it was meant to say, hey, Fluid Framework can operate at the scale of some of the complex problems we solve in the productivity suites like Office apps. So as a demonstration, I have here a Fluid file. So you'll see this to open your doclib as a .fluid file. And when you open it, it opens it in Fluid Preview. So the way that works is a Fluid file has what's called a default component on it. And then in the case of Fluid Preview, files created with Fluid Preview, the default component is a text editor. So of course, if I type in here, uh, the text, I have this, the same document open side by side. So you'll see that the collaboration is super fast. And the, of course, that's exactly what we've been promising. Fluid Framework is meant to make collaboration easy and fast, so yes. We used a collaborative data structure here called shared string that kind of builds in some of the complexity around, you know, merging user state, you know, when two people are trying to type in the same place, there's a lot of complicated logic to figure out so we can have, you know, a string that makes sense as the merged output of what the two people were typing. Uh, the fluid preview uh, component canvas for text editing also supports hosting other components as nested components. So to kind of describe a little bit what that's like, when you at mention someone, so I'm going to at mention my friend Cosmin, and it'll bring me this share dialog, and I'm going to give him access to the document. So what happens now is that we rendered an at mention component. That's not a feature of the text editor. That's its own fluid component. It uses the map data structure to kind of manage, you know, who the people you can at mention are, who's the current at mention of, a reference of all the other at mentions that person may have in this document, so you can kind of navigate to them. And that's a super important concept that you want to keep in mind. Remember, the at mention component was written as its own component, not part of the text editor. We also have this plus menu here that shows some of the other components we can insert. One of the most popular ones is this table component. This table component, of course, is collaborative. So if I type in here, it propagates to the other window. But the other important thing is this table component can also nest components. Now, bear with me here. So we have this text editing component. That's the default component. Within it, we now have a table component, and within that, the table component can host other components. So we have three layers of components here. So one of the important, powerful things is we can render any component in the table component. Of course, that means we can at mention. So when I'm at mentioning Cosmin here, I didn't add at mention support to this table. The table just supports fluid components. So what that means is any fluid component just works with the table. I didn't need to spend weeks developing at mention support for the table. We just got it by using the fluid ecosystem. So one of the other interesting aspects of Fluid is kind of the fact that these components can kind of break down the barriers between apps. So this is that same table component I received in an email from a colleague. So here it's rendered in line in Outlook on the web. So I can interact with the table here, can check things off, and I can also open it in Fluid Preview. So if I open that here on the side, this is the full view of that table. So this opens the table probably in some context of some larger document, but the interesting thing is, you know, if I edit the table here, it updates the email in real time. And I can, you know, check things here and you can see the presence propagating between the two of them. This is the second part of Fluid that, you know, we when we set out to build it, we kind of saw how this was a super powerful encapsulation of with a component model, which lets us kind of break down the barriers between apps and kind of lets us collaborate in ways that are currently isn't really possible in M365 ecosystem. We're excited to see what the Fluid framework continues to evolve and we're with the open source movement, we're, we're really hoping to see what the community can build and how we can incorporate that to make M365 even better. Um, so hopefully that gives you an overview of how we use the Fluid framework to build some experience, some first party experiences at Microsoft. Hopefully that gets your imagination going and what you can do with Fluid framework for your own experiences. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Jocko. Well, thank you so much, uh, Christian. So up next, uh, we have more content for, prepared for you. And the second uh, most popular topic is uh, to understand how Fluid can, uh, uh, components can be used with uh, different uh, view libraries. And for that, I have uh, Matt uh, that I want to put on. So hi, Matt. Sure. Hey, how's it going? Um, 
So yeah, I want to talk to you today about what we're doing to make it super easy to uh, use your fluid components and render them with whatever view framework you want. Um, so going back to that first demo that we showed with Sam, uh, where we had the dice roller demo, um, I want to talk a little bit more about how we get that on the screen. So here I'm going to focus on the iDice roller interface I've defined for that fluid component that he was talking about with the functionality that my view is going to use. So I have a value, of course, that I can get as a number. Uh, I have the ability to roll the die, and I have an event listener here for dice rolled, which is going to be emitted whenever the value changes remotely. Um, so the uh, view of, that I'm using here is really just a, a regular React component. Um, I had taken the props, which are going to be that I dice roller that I just defined. Um, I'm going to use the value as my state. And then whenever I get that dice rolled event, I'm going to set the dice value to the new value. Um, from there, it's just regular rendering with React. Um, the end result I get there, uh, I might have styled this one up a little bit, but we have the same thing happening um, uh, using just a regular React component. Of course, you don't have to use React um, since we have this iDice roller interface. It's totally possible to use that with other view frameworks. So here I have one that I'm using view for. Um, very similarly, I'm just taking the value off the model, uh, listening to the dice rolled event um, when someone remote clicks the, uh, the button. And same thing there. Uh, I can have my dice roller working with view as well. Um, so what we've done here is basically separate the model and view so that you can use whatever view framework you want and build it on top of the data uh, and just respond to it when it has uh, remote changes um, and basically build whatever interface you want. Um, this one's super simple, but obviously some of the ones in the Fluid preview are much more complicated. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. And uh, what we'll do now is that we'll start uh, taking questions uh, from the question feed, so just keep them coming. We've already started answering some of them uh, there, but uh, we'll take some that's, uh, uh, that's there and sort of ask them live to uh, one of the developers that we have here. And the first question is from Stan, uh, and um, I'll uh, post that to, uh, to, to Skylar. So the question is, um, I'd love a general overview of the Fluid framework, uh, as well as, as an example of usage in C Sharp, if possible. Sam? Uh, no, sorry, Skylar. Thanks, Jacob. That's a good question. Uh, Fluid is built as a web first framework. Currently, we're supported in JavaScript. And any JavaScript, uh, any place that you can run a JavaScript runtime. Uh, I think Sam gave a quick overview, and then Nick is actually doing, our, our colleague is doing a showcase at 9 o'clock uh, Pacific time, which is one hour after this event starts. So you can look there for a further deep dive into building fluid components. Thank you, uh, Skylar. The next uh, question I have is for Dan. Uh, it's from Alexi. And, um, uh, you've mentioned the uh, fluid preview in uh, or the dot fluid file types in SharePoint. Uh, where can I see some uh, more examples of, of this? Thanks, Alexi. Um, I think uh, I'm going to read the question as I've seen a dot fluid file on a screen during a keynote, and you said it was in SharePoint. Uh, where can I see more of those? And so we've released a uh, a website. I think we've already mentioned it a few times. Fluidpreview.com, and it's live for all of the maybe the th same thing that happened to uh, Christian just happened to me uh, and Skylar. But anyway, uh, we've released uh, a, a preview uh, at fluidpreview.com, and you can go there and. <clears throat> use the fluid framework uh, as we envisioned it the way that we described it here today uh, to to uh, to test out like co-authoring uh, to do that with another friend of yours in the same microsoft 365 tenant uh, and you can save those to sharepoint or you can save those to onedrive uh, and i think that's the uh, i think that's as good as i can do with you mentioned fluid and where can i see samples so you'll be able to see those dot fluid files in your sharepoint site uh, if you log into fluidpreview.com and create them. Thank you, Dan. The next question I have is uh, for Sam. And uh, 
The question is, uh, when you mention web-based uh, frameworks, are we talking JavaScript-based stuff or more forward-looking stuff, uh, technologies like uh, Blazor? Oh, that, that's a great question. So, yeah, I'm not super familiar with Blazor. My understanding is it's like a C-sharp.net uh, web framework. When we talk about JavaScript-based stuff, web-based frameworks, we're talking about things that use the JavaScript runtime. So Fluid Framework is a is a is JavaScript based in part because we have a distributed system and it's easiest to um, uh, maintain an eventually consistent state if we can live deploy the JavaScript code to every connected client and make sure that the the code being used is reasonably you know at least you know within some version of each other. And so we're JavaScript, not C sharp yet, but we've you know looked into that kind of thing as well. Thank you so much, Sam. Next question I have uh, is for Skylar. Uh, so Skylar, uh, where's the shared data stored and uh, can I create my, create my own backend store? Yeah, that's a really good question, Jakob. Um, the, so so the, there's two sides to the Fluid infrastructure. One is the client side, um, which does a lot of this merge logic, so it's interweaving all these operations. Uh, and the other side is the Fluid server itself. And the Fluid server is designed to basically process operations and then um, output them back to all the different connected clients. Uh, currently, SharePoint uh, within Microsoft it is built has built a Fluid server um, that op that processes these operations and stores them as .fluid files. Uh, if you saw Sam's demo and Matt's demo, um, they, they demoed actually with a local Fluid server um, that will be open sourcing um, as a reference implementation as part of the open source platform. So uh, yeah, you should be able to uh, build your own Fluid server as well. Thank you so much, uh, Skylar. Uh, the next question I will give to uh, Matt. So let me bring uh, Matt up here. And uh, that question is from uh, from NC. And the question is, I see that the Fluid experience is tracking the user's focus and syncing across views, even for complex views like tables. What's the developer experience like for that? For example, if I wanted to build a table where the focus is on a row rather on a cell, how would I do that? Sure. Uh, yeah, so ultimately the uh, presentation that you have for the user's uh, focus is under your control if you're the one writing the view. Um, so for that table, if you want to show a row-based focus, uh, you would do basically the same thing that we're doing for that view, um, but just alter the way that you're, you're rendering it out. What we're doing there is we have a... Um, Kind of a parallel system to our da distributed data structures called uh, signals, um, which are more or less transmitting uh, point in time information that uh, is not persisted long term. So that communicates the location of the user's cursor, um, but is not persisted long term in the document. Um, so what that lets you do is uh, watch that and uh, get information about specifically what their uh, focus is set on. Um, so again, it's fully under your control. Um, you get the signals and you can respond to them however you would like to. That's uh, excellent. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I'll give the next question to you as well because it's about view, uh, view frameworks. Uh, and the, the question that I have is from Chris. Uh, and uh, are these components being rendered within the Fluent Framework Library or using some underlying technology such as React? Sure. Um, yeah, so the ones that we just showed today um, in those in the short demos we just did, we're using React and Vue. Um, but you can use whatever framework you want. Um, we've experimented some with Angular as well. Uh, we definitely have uh, worked with integrating Fluent UI into the Fluid components. Um, and yeah, I think uh, the main thing we want to provide here is flexibility. So if you're familiar with a certain Vue framework or Vue technology, we want to make sure that you can use that with the Fluid components for your data. Awesome. The next uh, question is for Dan. Uh, so Dan, uh, what is re the relationship between Fluid and Office? Uh, if I wanted to add components for collaborative maps in that Fluid plus Teams or Fluid plus Outlook experience, 
what is the pathway to do that? The question is from NC. Thanks, NC. Uh, I'm going to try to do a better job answering Alexi's last question and NC's at the same time here. So the relationship is the way we've built Fluid into office experiences right now is all of your Fluid data structures are backed by a .fluid file. Those will be in SharePoint or they'll be in OneDrive. And I think we mentioned that earlier. Also, that gets you a whole bunch of benefits like compliance and good storage and all the things that you would get from SharePoint. So a bunch of hard problems that you don't have to solve. And then how do I get Fluid experiences into Office is you would project those uh, into Outlook for the web or into Teams via a URL. Uh, and Outlook for the web and Teams will both load those things. So uh, you build the experience that you want. Uh, you back that experience with whatever code that you want, still from a CDN somewhere. You work on the distributed data structures that are stored in the .fluid file on SharePoint and they're projected and rendered into the experience on Outlook for the web or Teams. Uh, so that's how you get that integration there. The distributed data structures stay on SharePoint. Uh, the experience is mastered on your screen uh, with all the code that you wrote, local, local code. Uh, if you want to add a component, maps into their path. So yeah, I think I got that. And sorry, Alexi, about the uh, strange answer last time. I got confused about something. All right. That's good, uh, Dan. And the next question is uh, for Sam. Uh, and uh, Sam, is uh, this technology based on Signal R, or is it uh, the next gen that we should looking to adopt? I'll mute myself there. I, uh, <clears throat> it's a good question. We are built on WebSockets, but when I think of the Fluid Framework model, we're really talking mostly about these distributed data structures. And they're built a whole layer on top of WebSockets. It's, I think you'll enjoy using our SDK. It doesn't really feel like you're working directly with the WebSocket itself. What we're doing is we're using the WebSockets to pass back and forth the deltas or the ops, but basically the information that we need to create these eventually consistent data structures. You're mostly going to interact with these local objects when you use the SDK. So hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, uh, Sam. Uh, the next question I have is for Skylar. Uh, Skylar, you have worked on the Fluid Framework uh, for a while as a developer. What is the most challenging aspects of building the Fluid Framework? That's a really great question. I think we're we're trying to build this this middle layer here between, as Sam mentioned, um, like WebSockets, um, things like Socket.io that currently exist, which allow for, it allows for sending messages quickly across the internet. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to enable a generic framework that allows people to collaborate on the same underlying data um, and do that in real time as fast as possible across, you know, wide ranges of, uh, of you know, where people are from a geographic point of view. Um, so I think kind of this, this balance of having a good cons or developer facing platform while also having this performance and this uh, reliability that comes with running like a, a very complicated service. Excellent. I'm just really glad he didn't say working with Dan. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Dan. The next question I have is uh, for Sam. Uh, so, Sam, um, would this uh, technology also be hostable inside of a Next.js application? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. Um, and just by the way, Dan, it's great working with you. Uh, so, <laughs> we uh, we uh, can, of course, be in a Next.js uh, application. We actually, uh, when we were first sort of bootstrapping some of these hosts, we gave them a React component that had the necessary fluid loader logic so that this little you know, React component, just a I don't know, 50, 100 lines of code, uh, pulled in our fluid loader, that React component could host any uh, fluid component. So we imagine that most of these frameworks that are using JavaScript, you know, their front end framework, they'll be able to embed some version of the fluid loader and then load uh, fluid components with that.
I think Jakob is processing. <laughs> yeah, he's really thinking through my answer. Thank you, Sam. I'll, I'll let you take the next question as well, since you are already out there. <laughs> sure. Uh, absolutely. I'm, you know, I'm still here, although uh, not visible right now in the live feed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. awesome. I'm back. So uh, the question is for you, Sam. Uh, sure. Which which library is used to merge the user edits in the text editor? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's a really good question. So um, we actually address text editing as one of our core scenarios, and you might have seen this in the 2019 build demo, also in this build demo. But we have super super low latency typing, where you can see every keystroke replicated onto your your client. And we do that with our shared string. That's one of our distributed data structures. It's probably one of our algorithmically most complex. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a library, but it's definitely um, the shared string package. And um, it's one of our DDSs. We think that you'll enjoy playing with it uh, once we open source. Thank you, Sam. The next question I'd like to pose to uh, Dan and uh, that question is from uh, David. Can Home Office 365 users access Fluid Preview? We are working on that. Uh, we don't have anything to say about the dates right now. And that's, that's the answer. But we're really excited about that. Wonderful. I have a question uh, for you from Jazz. Um, is the data distribution system also being open sourced? Yes, actually the distributed data structures where we're open sourcing. Uh, what do you mean by distributed data system? Do you guys think that's asking about uh, the routing mechanism and storage? Yeah, maybe the reference implementation, which we are open sourcing. Yes, yes. Excellent, thank so you. Yes. Uh, the answer is yes. Okay. Thank you, Dan. So um, the next question I'll put to uh, Skylar. Uh, and uh, Skylar, this question is from Chris. And uh, could I have the entire state of a page under one fluid component? Or is it designed for pages to have their state split across multiple components? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the fluid component model is really flexible and you can think of fluid components as uh, data components. And one of the, the cool things is you get to architect your data components uh, how, how you really want. And we generally think about components as reusable bits. So in Christian's example, we have a table and we can take this table and we can move this, this component or this singular table somewhere else. Um, but that architecture is completely up to you as the developer. So if your scenario calls for having everything within one uh, fluid component because you believe that gives you better flexibility, um, or if you want multiple smaller components that you can uh, move around and use to build solutions, then that's really all up to you. Thank you, uh, Skylar. The next uh, question I, I have, I would like to pose to Christian. Um, and the question comes from Added and is about uh, the UI framework. So uh, let me put Christian up here and say, how does Fluid relate to the Fluent UI or the uh, what was also previously called the Fabric UI? Does it supersede it? Yeah, it's kind of a, an unfortunate uh, sequence of naming there that, that causes a bit of confusion. Uh, no, so Fluid does not actually provide any UX controls out of the box. Uh, so we actually are designed to work super well with the with the with the with the Fab Fluent UI open source library, which is for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a it's a React uh, component library that makes that has a bunch of components that look a lot like the look and feel of Office 365. Fluent Preview actually uses Fluent UI everywhere. Um, so so we actually have proven that you can build awesome experiences using both of them together. They're not meant to replace one another. They actually work well together. Uh, thanks, Christian. I will give you the next question as well, and that's from Alexei that asked about the dot .fluid uh, file. Is the dot .fluid file my component definition? 
Yeah, so the doc fluid file is kind of the artifact we create. Um, so so if, if you crack it open, it won't be super intelligent what it looks like, but um, it, it's basically has all the metadata about what's in the contents of the file, what code you need to load with it, because you, as I showed, you know, there could be more than one component. There's actually a whole process from when you create the fluid file that uh, that yes, in, in essence, yes, it is your component definition, but it's it's not so much like you can open the file and, and edit it by hand. It's it's meant like you make some API calls and then the output is a doc fluid file, which of course you could click anywhere and then yes, it, it would define what the component that shows up. And in fluid preview, we create it with a text editing component by default, but as Sam showed, you can do plenty of things uh, and it's not limited to just what fluid preview can do. Thank you so much, uh, Christian. Uh, the next question uh, I'll post to, to Skylar and hang in there because it's a little bit of a longer question that Ryan uh, asked us. So am I understanding the architecture correctly in that the first client that connects, connects sets the initial state and from that point other clients connect to the first and share that state? Or is there something running on the web server that stores the initial state? If something on the web so server stores that state, what are our options for state storage on the server? Yeah, that's a, a very, very good uh, question, multi-part question. Um, so I'll touch on the beginning, which is talking about just the component model in general. Uh, and again, I'll point you to uh, our colleague, Nick has a talk. It starts like an hour after this talk, I forget the name, but. Um, definitely check out that talk because he shows his component and he goes deep dive through everything there. Um, but the, the function Sam was showing there is about initialization. So we're talking about the first time we ever create this collaborative component. There might be some upfront work we want to do to initialize state. Distributed systems are notoriously really, really difficult um, because you, you have this question of, hey, who creates this the first time? How do we initialize this state? Uh, so having these uh, these functions or these these calls that you can kind of override, they allow you to easily manage. You know, I'm the first one ever creating this component object, and I want to initialize the dice roller with some value. Let's say it's six. Let's say it's four. Whatever. Um, so so that's kind of what that that function does. And then the has initialized also talks about. Um, so every time someone loads that, including yourself, after that, we need to make sure that we're loading some state so that we can, you know, do things like rendering correctly. Um, the second part was about servers. Um, Yakov, can you like throw that back at me quickly? Yeah, the, the second part of the question was, you know, if there's something on the server, you know, can we control where to put that state or where the state is stored? Uh, that's a good question. So currently we have this uh, fluid format, which is operations and uh, Tyler and Peter actually did a talk, which is up on YouTube right now, um, earlier in the day today, where they kind of go a little bit deeper into how that backend server works. Um, but the the code or the, the operations live in this dot fluid file, or they can live in your own server implementation. Uh, we've played a bit with like, how do we, you know, store in existing um, uh, with the existing data storage solutions. And I think Tyler and Peter um, have a pretty good example of that in that, that video. So go check that out. That's wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful, um, Skylar. So the next question is uh, for Dan. So while I bring Dan up here, um, can you talk about, you know, when to use the fluid uh, framework? Is there a particular criteria where we should think about about using the fluid framework, uh, for example, when you need to do X, fill in the blanks here, that's from Prem. Cool. Um, the fluid frameworks uh, really neat magic trick is distributed state. So if you have any experience that you want to have on multiple screens or multiple windows or happen across multiple instances at the same time, there's almost no better way, at least in my head, I'm a little biased, but um, there's no better way to think uh, forward with fluid in that case. Like you would want to build that experience on top of fluid. Um, I think also if you uh, if you want your experience to be collaborative, uh, which most things are collaborative these days, we find that like most of the time any experience that you build that you can only work on it by yourself, um, 
that that tends to not it, it tends to not work as well. People like to work with other people. They like to get their input. They like to send them a quick link and say, "What do you think about this?" Uh, they like to point to small pieces of it. Uh, Fluid Framework is particularly good at that with our component model. So if you wanted to build an experience that is mastered, it's very large, and then you wanted a small piece in the middle to share out, Fluid Framework is also really good for something like that. Um, and then uh, just in general, the collaborative nature of Fluid, we, we have a lot of research that shows us that um, collaboration is only increasing, almost so much that when I say the word collaboration <clears throat> now, people are like, that's, that's like a weird word. Why do you even use that? Like, that's just work. Um, and so if you're building something today and you're asking yourself, do I need to make this collaborative? The answer is probably yes. Uh, you might just not have caught up to the trend in the industry of everybody works on all things together at work now. And so uh, those would be three good reasons, I think, to work on Fluid Framework. Thank you so much, Dan. One thing I want to mention that as you probably we see this is a live session. We are here live and uh, one of the things that we do to coordinate what questions that we are answering in the live session, we are actually using a document that is in the fluid preview right now. Uh, and uh, so I have a question here, actually two questions for uh, for Sam that we want to. Uh, there's a, f a few things that we want to uh, know. So Delisma want to know if you are on some Pacific island or whether the battery <laughs> in your clock is just dead. I'm quarantining in like a shack outside my house. This is that, that clock's dead. Yeah, I'm uh, on the east coast though. I'm back with my family now. Okay. Uh, okay. What, what's thanks up? For, so. Thanks for taking care of that. The second yeah, question that I have: uh, Can a bot be a user in a document and see and react to the changes in that document that other users are making? And yes. that question is from Paul. From Paul. Great. Yeah, no, Paul, that's an awesome question. And that's actually been fundamental to a few of our really exciting demos. So so we did this live translation demo. We've done a few of these intelligent agent demos. Maybe even spell check could be implemented like this. But our, our collaboration is so low latency and our server implementation is so cheap that we can have really a large number of users you know, working on one document at the same time. You saw actually maybe the meta puzzle today from... Uh, at the end of Rajesh's keynote that Dan was working on. So um, because of this, we can have a number of non-human users, robots, intelligent agents working on the document with us, running some sort of logic. One thing we've done a lot is had a robot watch a uh, user typing and then translating it uh, like into maybe a, a paragraph below um, leveraging Azure's translation services. So that's the kind of thing that happens. And we've had, you know, dozens of uh, robo users in one document session with one user to add intelligence and other features. That's fantastic, uh, Sam. The next question I have is for Skylar and it's coming from Alexei. Uh, so Skylar, uh, I've heard that there's an SDK or I've heard something about an SDK. Is there an SDK and when can I use it? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, so the we're we're, open, we're actually open sourcing the entire Fluid Framework repo, which includes the reference server that we talked about. It includes those uh, getting started packages. It's being a you know, Fluid Flow, which allows you to bootstrap into building components. Um, it's going to be open sourced in the upcoming months. We don't have an exact date, but we're really really excited to get it out. Thank you so much, uh, Skylar. Uh, and uh, the next question I'd like to pose to uh, to Matt. Uh, so, uh, Matt, this is coming from Jazz. Uh, can a user add comments uh, or track changes in the document, uh, or replay the edits made to the document? Sure. So there's um. There's a few features there that were mentioned, but uh, in general, this is something that could be built on top of the Fluid Framework. Um, so for instance, we talked about like uh, presence notification in the Fluid Preview app uh, is built on top of what the Fluid Framework provides. Um, as far as uh, integrated support within the Fluid Framework, we're looking at things like attribution, um, but there's certainly a variety of these sorts of features um, examining the transformation of the data over time that we're looking at as well. Thank you, Matt. Maybe this is related to uh, the next uh, question that's sort of on, on, a, on the same line. Is there a way to separate between a moderator collaborator and a client or is it something that needs to be created? I see. 
Um, so for the most part, currently all clients are treated uh, treated fairly equal um, as collaborators on the document. Um, we have experimented some with having uh, specialized privileges for certain uh, collaborators uh, owning certain data structures and that sort of thing. Um, but it's something that we would be definitely interested to pursue further. Um, it's not something that we have uh, a lot of right now, though. For the most part, it'd be pretty um, parallel between users on the document. OK, thank you so much, Matt. Uh, next question is for Sam. And uh, Sam, uh, will this uh, work with any web-based text editor? And that question is from Rob. Rob, yeah. Um, I actually demoed um, this morning some integration with Draft.js. That's a great open source text editor. And we have done integrations with a few. It's um, it's a core scenario for us, but it won't work like you know right out of the box. These text editors are complicated, and doing collaboration over the web is complicated. The Draft.js example that we have um, that I demoed earlier today, I want to say it was like 200 lines of it, model adapter code, 100 of like you know real fluid stuff. So. I know the Draft.js model fairly well, and I know our shared string model fairly well. It took me like an afternoon. That's the kind of time you should expect to spend to um, to integrate with a an open source text editor or whatever text editor you're using, probably model dependent. So that's that's the kind of thinking I'd be doing to answer that kind of question, Rob. Wonderful, Sam. The next question is for you as well, and it's from Anne. From what I'm hearing, uh, it would seem that Fluid components are basically hostable from a Fluid server. Does that does this mean that they don't live with the site source code, or would that be possible when not hosting for SharePoint or for uh, Teams? Yeah, so there's a few parts to that question. I think I'm just going to try to break it down, uh, sort of, hopefully this is clarifying. So we have our uh, we have our container. I'm looking over here because I just got messaged the uh, the question, so I can see it again. Uh, the uh, we have our SharePoint implementation of the server. Uh, we'll ship a reference implementation, which means that you could run a component against that. We currently are having each of our containers, our documents, go against just one server, so they kind of have that you know they know where their server is and they expect to have some data that that server's hosting for them, but you can run the same code, so the same um, component, that bundle of logic and the distributed data structures that go with it, against another server, you just, you would be a new instance of that, of that document. So, you know, when there's other ideas, you could maybe move it from one server to another, but we just haven't discussed that yet. We're still pretty early days with Fluid Framework. Right now, we expect that each instance will be homed with one server, and uh, that's, that's probably how it's going to work, you know, at least at first. So I hope that answers your question, man. Thank you, Sam. Uh, the next question I'd like to pose to uh, Christian, and uh, that is from the question is from Cassie, uh, and Cassie is asking, uh, do you have any experience building web collaboration uh, without the Fluid Framework, and could you share your view on how Fluid Framework makes that easier uh, uh, to build those types of applications? Of course, yeah, yeah. Actually, some interesting history is that Dan, myself, and Skyler actually came from the Office Online team. So we we originally were working for several years on Word Online, OneNote Online, those kinds of apps. Um, and actually, some of the initial effort for Fluid was inspired, like, hey, like we're, we're solving these common problems. We're trying to make existing Word applications more collaborative. We're trying to do richer and richer scenarios. How can we make it easier for our own developers to offer collaboration in a way that's you know has high performance, is accessible, um, and and scales to like new scenarios we haven't even thought of? And and we found that that was actually a super useful problem that exists in other contexts as well. So rather than build something specific for Word, we figured out like, hey, how can we make something useful to make Word feature development better and like deliver better performance, more reliability, uh, while also making it useful as a tool that you know our friends at Outlook and other parts of the company can use. And eventually, you know, it just spiraled to, hey, this is going to be something that's going to be super useful for our developer ecosystem. You know, collaboration, especially, you know, in the times we're living in right now is a super important uh, aspect of daily work. So so we're hoping that this this learnings we've had from our experience building office applications with collaboration um, and building this next generation of collaboration will 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 make it easier for developers who don't have the experience we had 
um, to kind of just have a good foundation. Like, hey, we're going to give you the tools to get going right away, and uh, hopefully it's a lot less friction to add collaboration to either existing apps or new scenarios. Thank you so much, Christian. Just as a little bit of a time check, we have about 10 minutes uh, left in the session. Uh, we'll use a few minutes to uh, wrap up, but this is a great chance for you to uh, ask questions directly to the developers working on the Fluid Framework team. So get your questions in. Uh, we have a few uh, questions left in the queue that uh, we can uh, uh, ask, and um, but uh, do get your questions in. Um, so, uh, Skylar, I'd like to ask you a question around uh, the uh, algorithms that are, are part of the Fluid Framework. So, did you have to implement some operational tr uh, transformation algorithm to tr track and resolve the operations in the in those data models? That's a good question. Um, some of the data, so the, the data models themselves or the distributed data structures, they implement their own type of uh, merge logic. Um, we have like, so we have the shared string. We also have things like the shared map or the shared directory. Um, the shared map, shared directory, the, the merge logic here is pretty simple because it's last writer wins. So as far as keeping a history of operations, we override based on whoever is the last person to store content. Uh, more complicated things like shared string where we're doing interleaving of characters within a string. Um, we we use something similar to OT, but uh, or operational transform, sorry, but it, it, it's not exactly like operational transform. So it's a very similar paradigm where we're managing um, how these characters are locally versus remotely versus other um, versus who's seen all these characters. And we're doing this kind of merge dance uh, using uh, something called like a merge tree. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Skylar. Uh, I have a question for you, Sam, uh, to talk a little bit about how this project uh, started. Can you share some of the thinking from, you know, what got the project started? Um, what did you do in the early days of the project? You've been on this project since two years yes. or something like that? Yeah, it's been three years. I joined uh, one year after coming to Microsoft, and at the time it was Steve Luco. Kurt Berglund and Tanvir Ayumi, just the three of them, like they didn't even have an area at Microsoft yet. Uh, they, the problem we were solving was how to make really fast collaboration. And the rest of these concepts that we're talking about have really sprung up from that. So it's been about three and a half years, I think, since the team, Steve and Kurt first got together. And uh, it's actually, it was a funny question to read just because this feels like quite a moment now that we're open sourcing soon. But uh, but yeah, it grew out of this this desire to go to for uh, super low latency collaboration, and then from that we realized we were distributing so much of our state. We had such a we, that that need drove us towards a distributed state model that we ended up including this component model, something that I call the chain code model, but it's the way that we deploy deploy code to uh, the connected clients. And so that's that's the origin story. It's really we wanted something really fast, and the rest of it sort of grew out of that. Uh, yeah, and I hope that answers the question. You know, I hope so too. And uh, <laughs> with that, I think we are toward the end of the Q&A. Uh, again, we have a few slides that we want to show you here at the end with uh, some opportunities for you uh, to consider. So uh, first and foremost, we will open source the Fluid Framework. We will announce that, and if you want to get a notice or a notification when that happens, use the QR code that we have in this particular slide and sign up to uh, to get that information. At, at the build conference, uh, we will also have a, a few other opportunities for you to participate and uh, participate with us live. In uh, less than an hour from now, uh, we will have uh, Nick uh, do the first presentation uh, that dives deeper into how to use the Fluid Framework. Uh, and uh, he has a great sample app that uh, he will show us. And again, there's uh, an opportunity to ask uh, questions once you've seen that. That live session will get repeated uh, three times 
uh, during the 48 hours of a uh, build and it will also be available recorded afterwards. There's also a session that's already online on uh, YouTube that you can go see where Peter and Tyler uh, gives an overview of uh, the, the fluid framework uh, uh, of the fluid framework. So go check that out as well. There's a few resources, fluidframework.com. Um, there's also the meta puzzle game that you can see and, and work collaborative with others. And finally, you are more than welcome to connect with uh, our speakers on uh, uh, Twitter. There's some Twitter handles there, and we are also on LinkedIn. With that, I want to thank you all for all of the great questions that you've asked. I'm sure you have a lot more uh, to come and we hope to answer them either in the sessions or in the things that will happen after the build conference. I'd also like to thank uh, all of the developers uh, and uh, Dan that we had on this uh, panel today. Good job answering the questions. Have a great evening, morning or afternoon, wherever you are and uh, Welcome to uh, the, the Fluid Framework, uh, and we hope that you will be on the journey for that with us. Thank you so much.